Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to webinar three of our virtual masterclass series. Um, and today we're going to be discussing, well, we're looking at comparing the new uh, Enigma VSEP guidelines to for BRCA1 and BRCA2 with our existing or current guidelines uh, in the field, this field of variant interpretation. Next slide, please. So uh, my usual duties. So just a couple of housekeeping duties that we need to make you aware of. So we have automatically muted your uh, microphones to avoid any background noise. Please do try to keep your microphones turned off at all times. Um, we are recording the webinar. Uh, so we, hopefully we should have that webinar available to you to, for you to review at your leisure on the GenQA and EMQN YouTube channel sometime in the next three or four months <clears throat> at the latest. Uh, so if you can't make it today, then obviously you will be able to, or your colleagues will be able to pick it up at a later date. Um, and as always, these these webinars are and virtual masterclasses are supposed to be interactive, uh, and we strongly encourage you to to contribute and um, ask questions of the of the today's speakers. So you can use the Q and A function to submit your questions. Uh, we've we've got about an hour or so of uh, of, of overview and and review of the guidance. Uh, and then time allocated at the end for some questions and answers. So please do use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Next slide, please. Uh, your feedback uh, has already contributed to us changing the, the strategies and the discussion we, we, we bring to you in our, in our masterclass series. Uh, so we do value it. It's great, very important to us. Uh, and obviously it does help provide and ensure that we provide uh, high quality educational and training materials for you and your colleagues. Um, so after the webinars concluded, you should receive an email um, with a short link to a feedback survey, five, no more than five minutes, usually two to two minutes to complete it. Please do take time just to compute that feedback and, um, and contribute to our, uh, our own learning as well, if you like, from, from what we've been delivering to you. Next slide, please. So, uh, my name is Simon Patton, and together with my co-host, uh, Professor Sandy Deans, you'll be very familiar with both of us. Uh, we've got a fantastic uh, uh, webinar lined up for you today. Two great speakers, uh, really knowledgeable, got lots of experience in this field. Um, so we have Claire Turnbull from London in the UK, who's the CanVig lead and supported by a CRUK grant, uh, been working in the cancer community area and particularly on variant interpretation for a very long time. Uh, and Arjun uh, Mensenkamp uh, from Nijmegen in the Netherlands, who has been working on the Enigma uh, VSET group as well. So lots of experience here between the two speakers, um, both incredibly knowledgeable and, 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 lo and, and lots of experience in this field. Uh, and I think you'll really enjoy today's talk and find it highly educational. Uh, next slide, please. So just a, a quick, dis uh, just quick disclaimer. Um, next slide, please. And I'll hand over to my colleague, Sandy Deans. Thank you, Simon. So I'll just join, add my welcome to everyone to today's very exciting um, webinar with our expert panel. So pleased that both Claire and Arjun could join us today. So what we're going to focus on is really starting to build upon the observations and the learnings and educational element of the external quality assessment modules that we've been providing for the classification of variants within not just BRC1 and BRC2, where we first initially started, but also with the expansion on the other HRR genes. And I think we've come to some um, understanding that it's difficult to classify these variants, in particular when there's different guidelines, different sources of ways how to do this. And one of the Simon says responses from a lot of participants was, can you give us some guidance of which guidelines we should be using and how to apply them in the most appropriate way. So hence we have our workshop today and hopefully we can get some good questions um, happening at the end of the session. So next slide, please. So we've already completed an external quality assessment run for variant interpretation in 2023. So this was run 10 and was completed earlier in the year. So one of the power of um, providing external quality assessment is you can actually gather information on what is happening in the real world. Now, whether that's methodology, testing strategies, the way people report results, that it also comes down to how people um, 
classify the variants of which guidelines they use. So here is just a snapshot and summary of the guidelines that have been used by the participants, which was nearly 600 individuals globally um, across the, um, the, the six cases that we provided for run 10. So no surprise, the majority of individuals, 41%, were using the ACMG 2015 guidelines that we know and use so um, much and um, expansively across the whole of, of genomics. We had 13% um, of individuals who were using these guidelines and also the UK ACGS 2020 guidelines. We also then had an increase of participants from previous years using a combination of three different guidelines, and this included the Canvig UK guidelines. And then we had 13% who used other different sources of um, recommendations. So Claire, can I ask you to come in here and comment on how really the Canvig guidelines in the UK evolved and what the purpose was for them? Yes, thank you, Sandy. So um, CANVIG UK is Cancer Variant Interpretation Group UK, and this started up in 2017 at the request of ACGS, the Association of Clinical Genomic Science, around um, specifying and educating and training around what was then the new ACMG guidance. Um, and what, uh, as CANVIG evolved, one of the things we did was produce interim gene specific guidance while well, we've been awaiting the um, finalized versions coming out from the VSIPs. So the BRC1, BRC2 CAMVIG guidance was very deliberately interim. However, um, with the publication of the Enigma VSIP earlier this year, there's been some hesitation about within the Canvi group about switching over immediately because we know that there's the new ACMG guidance looming on the horizon. But I think it's useful to emphasize that Canvig is not, um, we, we don't per se want to have separate guidance from the Enigma VSIP. So we'd really be looking um, as the new ACMG is embedded and the Enigma is updated accordingly to then at that point um, get, get the UK community crossed over so we're all lined up. Great, thank you, Claire. I think that's a, a worry people are concerned about. Were we using the wrong guidelines? Should we be switching? And so some guidance there is really helpful. Thank you. So next slide, please. So as I mentioned, we can sort of um, gather the information in the real world. And when we compare that data that I've just um, um, demonstrated that you can see from previous years. So last year we had runs eight and nine of the variant classification. We had 41% of participants using the ACMG guidelines alone. So you can see there's a shift happening there. Um, and as Claire very um, said just now, that we are all expectantly waiting for the update of these guidelines that we are hoping will come out um, for a con um, consultation later this year. And the latest we've heard is that is still on track. So hopefully we'll be able to give you messaging when we have notification as well, um, and we'll be able to see what the changes are um, to be mm -hmm. applied. So next slide, please. So as Claire's mentioned here, we've got our ACGS 2020 guidance. We also have then the, the different CANVIG UK guidance that have been um, issued, um, not just the general one, but also gene specific guidance. Um, and that's then also been um, supplemented with the ACMG classification rules, which is specifically for ATM. And then very recently, we've had the ClinGen um, variant interpretation guidelines for PAL B2. And then next slide, please, Amy. We've also got the very recently released um, Enigma guidelines for BRCA1, BRCA2, um, which is the BRCA2 version there. So you can see that um, things are evolving. It is a moving feast just now. And I think it's there's no reason um, to be ashamed that everyone is struggling with which guidelines to apply because it's in getting more and more complex um, and more um, specific as we move through um, different variations of guidelines being published. So next slide, please. So which guidelines should be used? This is the question. So guidelines do continue to evolve. And as we've just been mentioning, we're expecting even more updates coming very, very soon. So the most current guidelines that are in play just now is the Enigma guidelines, which was published um, in 2023 for BRC1 and BRC2. You have the ACMG classifications for ATM. You've got the Canvig UK classification recommendations for CHECK2, 
And then you have also the ClinGen ACMG for PAL-B2. So hopefully that will signpost you into what is the most recent and up-to-date guidelines for gene-specific variant interpretation. So next slide, please. So I'm now going to hand over to our second expert, Arjun, who is going to explain um, the, the Enigma guidelines here. Thank you, Arjun. Uh, thank you, Sandy. Um, indeed, I will discuss this uh, today with you, the ClinGen Enigma guidelines. Um, they were uh, recently published uh, thanks to enormous work by, by Mandy Spurdell and Michael Parsons, especially from Australia and the whole Enigma team. Um, if you're questioning where can I find the guidelines, you can find them in the criteria specification registry. Would you please click that link? Um, it will open there exactly it's here at the CGR. You can find all the, the, the guidelines and completely at the end of the page, you can find very important, enormous amount of appendices, 50, 50 or more pages, but even more important, the table four and nine you can find there. And they are very useful. And I will mention them uh, in my talk uh, later on, but you can find them there in the guidelines uh, completely at the end. So next slide, please. I will just start with PVS1. PVS1, you know, is, is important for null variants, nonsense, frame shift variants in genes where loss of function is a known mechanism of disease. Uh, the, the, for next slide, please. For the um, uh, ACMG guidelines, the, the first version was quite rude. And later on, it was extensively uh, adapted by Tayun et al, in which they made a very nice flow scheme and uh, it's, it's always hard to read but you probably know it it is divided in a nonsense a frame shift variants spy side variants and uh, axon deletions and following a path will lead to a classification uh, next slide please for nonsense and frame shift variants especially in the three prime end of a gene it is important whether or not a nonsense mediated decay is expected um, a nonsense mediated decay uh, uh, appears when uh, during translation, the uh, appears a uh, exon junction complex after a stop codon, which you would not normally expect, of course. But if a exon junction complex is detected after a stop codon, the um, uh, uh, the transcript is degraded by the LMD pathway. If a stop codon happens in the last exon, obviously that doesn't occur, and you still have a protein, albeit a little bit shorter. And um, for, uh, so therefore, it depends a lot whether you can apply PVS1 or not, or at which level. And for BSC1 and 2, actually, we have um, uh, much more knowledge. And uh, the, we have the last well described pathogenic variant, and this is for BSC1 loose in 1854. And uh, this variant will not result in nonsense mediated decay, but we know it is pathogenic. So on that basis, PVS1 was modified. Uh, so until that level, it is strong, uh, PVS1 at uh, at very strong uh, level, upgraded from strong uh, compared to the Tayun guidelines. And if you have a stop mutation, uh, a stop variant, a stop gain variant after that uh, amino acid, you uh, cannot apply PVS1 at all, which is a downgrade from the uh, Tayun guideline. So there's a very strict border and of course, it doesn't say that the variant after that spot is not pathogenic, but we have no information on that. Or if it is pathogenic, the penetrance will be much lower. And next slide, please. For accents, uh, accent deletions and duplications, and here I give the example for BSCR1, application of PVS1 depends on the type of mutation and the location. Generally, loss of an axon uh, in an important functional domain is always pathogenic. Whereas an in-frame deletion outside these domains is not or not likely at least. And therefore there was a, a, a downgraded PVS1 indication to moderate for those in-frame deletions. Uh, next slide, I think is a pop-up to indeed that both BSC1 and BSC2 have uh, intrinsically disordered domains and in-frame deletions in those domains are quite tolerant. Next slide, please. For BCA2, the, the story is not much uh, different than BCA1. So an in-frame deletion in 
the PALB2 binding domain or the DNA binding domain is generally pathogenic. So you have a PVS1 very strong. And if a, your deletion occurs um, uh, outside these domains, it depends on circumstances, whether it is uh, very strong as a code or whether it's not applicable. And that is when uh, a deletion occurs with, when exon 11 is not uh, implicated. And we have a very good support for these rules. And uh, next slide, please. And, uh, and next slide. Because of functional studies that have been done in, in Leiden by the, in the paper, in the Mesman et al. paper, in which they tested the BSCA2 gene uh, with certain exons deleted. And for example, if you look at the uh, exon uh, uh, 4 to 7 deletion, which corresponds to a naturally occurring um, isoform, the um, homologous recombination activity is uh, still 100%. So here you can see the deletion of certain accents uh, appears not to be pathogenic or not fully pathogenic. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that an exon deletion in frame exon deletion is not always uh, pathogenic. The next slide, please. Um, if you talk about uh, splicing, things always get more uh, complicated. And there it depends largely on the location and the effect on the protein. Um, again, here damage uh, a spice variant that is damaging the uh, one of the important domains is generally pathogenic. All possible spice variants at the consensus spice sites are also given in the appendix in the appendices of the guidelines and the table four of the guideline. I will come back to that later. Um, um, but it is therefore there are so many exceptions which exon can be uh, uh, is needed or not or what the effect is of a spice site variant. Um, and to make it more easy, we summarized everything in, uh, um, in Appendix E, but also in Table 4 of the guideline. Next slide, please. And then we had a, a request uh, for if you follow these rules without much clinical uh, data, you notice that you will not get much further than a likely pathogenic variant. And especially for uh, circumstances that you have secondary findings, so no true cancer clinic. Um, it, it is especially in the US vital that you can reach a, a, a truly pathogenic classification. And for that purpose, we used a repurposing of the PM5 code, the PM5 protein truncating code. The PM5 code uh, originally is a missing change at an amino acid residue where a different missing change determined to be pathogenic has been seen before. Uh, it's not applicable uh, for BSA1 and 2, but it is with this uh, protein truncating um, uh, addition. Next slide, please. And um, uh, it is much easier to reach pathogenic with this uh, extra code if you do not have any clinical evidence. Next slide. And that was um, really uh, um, determined by really counting all known pathogenic variants in all the accents of BSA1 in this case, and reaching, stating the number of pathogenic variants in an exon, if you have, it is just behind the idea that if you have, if you know that in a certain exon, pathogenic variants occur, truncating variants or missense variants with a pathogenic effect, then you can uh, quite safely assume that your novel truncating variant in that exon is also pathogenic. And then you can apply PM5 uh, at a strong level. You notice here exon 8 and uh, 9, or 9 and 10, according to the legacy counting, uh, truncating variants there are not, uh, uh, has not been seen and not known. And therefore, you cannot apply that code. And it is very questionable if you find a truncating variant in one of those exons that it is truly pathogenic. For BSCA2, on the next slide, that is, a comparable story that uh, truncating variants were counting or pathogenic variants were counted in all these exons. And here you also note that in some exons, but not that many, we are either you cannot find those variants or those variants were not pathogenic in certain exons. And therefore you cannot apply PM5 in those exons, but for the vast majority of exons, and that makes sense, a truncating variant is likely to be pathogenic, and therefore you can also apply PM5 protein truncating. So then normally you will have a PVS1 
together with the PM5 strong, and you will end up with a classification of the variant being pathogenic. And this is quite novel for this guy. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a screenshot of that table four that I mentioned. And the first time you see the table, it might be a little bit confusing, but you can all filter, you can search in this table, and it indicates which uh, domain you are, but it also indicates uh, uh, whether a, um, a variant PM5 uh, can be applied and at which strength, whether a, um, a deletion of an exon is can be seen as, as, uh, as PVS1 or not. And on the out on the left hand side and the right hand side of the table, you also see information on the splice set variants on the uh, the one and two dinucleotide intronic variants, whether you can apply PVS1 or whether you uh, or not. And I will come back to that later. So this table, I will come back to this a couple of times more, and um, is really useful um, as the guideline is sometimes very confusing whether or not a truncating or splice set variant is pathogenic or can be whether PVS1 can be applied or not. And this table is made to make your life a little bit more easy, although it does also take here uh, a bit of, uh, uh, you have to get used to it, uh, just using, by using. Next slide, please. That brings me to uh, another novel application of PVS1, the PVS1 RNA. And PVS1 RNA replaces the code PS3 for uh, splicing as detected by RNA assays. And the BP7 RNA is the, of course, the, the, the counter version of it for if you do not detect any splicing defects. Next slide, please. And this code, um, we had to use this code because of the paper by uh, Walker et al. Well, Walker, Walker is also a member of the BSC12 VSAP. And most of the authors actually are also member of the BSC1 and 2 VSAP. And they um, made new recommendations uh, how to apply RNA uh, um, variation and RNA assays in your guidelines. And basically, you see here below a certain uh, a screenshot of a, a gene and whether you can apply if this axon is deleted which PVS1 code you can apply. If a, an exon is out of frame, and you can recognize that, that the left side and the right hand side of an exon has a different uh, format, then you can apply PVS1 because you have an out of frame effect. An intronic, an, an, an in-frame deletion um, is only PVS1 uh, when a critical domain is involved. But if the domain, if there is no domain involved, or at least not a domain with a a known function, uh, you have to reduce the strength to strong or moderate. Well, this is the basis also for the splicing. You can see that in the right hand corner, there are multiple codes that you can apply for prediction uh, of splicing prediction and also for splicing assays. And we applied this information also to the BSC1 and 2 guidelines in the next slide. Um, yes, again, Coming back to the Excel table four, in which this all information is summarized for each axon of BSC1 and 2, so you don't have to think about it yourself. Next slide. And this is then, uh, of course, the next question is how to interpret your RNA data. And the first, uh, the first step in there, in that is, can you show me the next pick? is that you look up in this table four whether loss of that exon is indeed um, uh, PVS1 or, or does it have a lower strength, PVS1 strong or moderate or supporting. And that is your starting point. And then you look at your data and if you have an assay which does include allele specific quantitation and you see a less than 10% of your type allele, then you can keep a PVS1 strength or RNA in this case, for your variant. And if you only have mini gene information, you will lose your strength. And uh, also you will lose also strength if you st still have some wild type transcript uh, present, then you will see that your strength in um, for PVS1 will uh, decrease 
to even PVS1 moderate or supporting if you can still see about 20% wild-type allele present. If you see more than 30% wild-type allele still present coming from the transcript with the variant, uh, you can even apply BP7 strong as that is quite certain uh, not a pathogenic variant. As we know that about 30% transcript from your allele is still enough for proper HRD function. Um, uh, so it's complicated, but normally, yeah, you you own, you really have to be sure that you lose most of your wild type allele, and if so, you can apply PVS one uh, RNA at the highest strength. Next uh, slide. Uh, if you do not have a allele specific quantitation, uh, yeah, next slide. Um, and and that is, for example, if you use Sanger and you do not have any uh, evidence uh, how much wild type allele you still have present, you can uh, you, you already have to reduce your strength. So uh, at the maximum, PVS1 strong RNA, um, if you have, a, um, as far as you can say, full loss of your um, exome uh, due to the splicing variant. And if you have apparent no impact, of course, you can apply BP7 strong RNA. Um, and so in that way, you can, um, this is, I think, for the, the Canfic rules, um, comparable to, to the PS3 uh, RNA adaptations. Next slide. And again, for the third time, look at table four, where this is explained also for these variants. You can see here in red, both on your left-hand side for, um, uh, for the acceptor variant, and on the right-hand side for the uh, for the donor variant, in red, a PVS1 RNA, and that means that in literature there is uh, functional evidence that this variant uh, leads to a uh, to a loss of an exon in this case, exon uh, 26, and, and which is pathogen. Then uh, next slide, please. Yeah, like I said again, here on the left hand side and the right hand side of this table four, you can find the information you need to see which code you can apply for your um, for your uh, intronic variants at the one and two dinucleotide positions. To make life a little bit easier, but also more complicated, there is also a novel adaptation of the PS1 code. PS1 you normally apply if your nucleotide change uh, gives a amino acid change that is already known to be pathogenic. This code has now been adapted for RNA, and you can apply it for exonic and intronic variants with the same predicted impact on splicing as another already known pathogenic variant. Next slide, please. And this is a table from the appendices, and it explains that, uh, uh, for example, if you look on the left-hand side, a variant under assessment, a VUA, so that is the variant you identified, if it is located outside the one to dinucleotide position, and you have a PP3 prediction, so you expect it based on your SPICE AI data that it will lead to a SPICE defect. And if you have a, a known pathogenic variant, exactly the same nucleotide, but different change, you can also apply PS1 and as an additional code. However, you must be uh, certain that the pathogenic variant or the, your variant under assessment is a same or higher spice AI prediction to be sure that you can indeed expect the same effect as the known variant. And as soon as uh, uh, um, the, the, and you have a downgrade of PS1 under different conditions, for example, uh, when your variant, the known pathogenic variant is not at the same position, but somewhere else in the same donor motive or same acceptor motive. Um, and, and there you also have the uh, comparable splice AI prediction, you can still apply PS1 moderate. However, if your rhetoric variant on the assessment is located at a 1, 2 dinucleotide position, you can uh, only uh, use PS1 supporting, and that is only for a buying for medical reason and just to prevent that your um, and that your level of evidence uh, gets too high for a single um, uh, item. 
So you can only apply PS1 supporting, otherwise your level of evidence would be too high. Um, I think this, um, and then again, be, please note that you can only use it if the effect of your variant under assessment is the same or stronger than the known pathogenic variant. Um, okay, next slide, please. I will give an example from RUN9. This was in a, a, a missense variant at plus six. At, for RUN9, we applied for the Canafic guidelines, the PM2 moderate. For the ACMG guidelines, you cannot uh, do that. You can only go to supporting. I will do, I will present those data later. And for Canafic UK, PS3 very strong was used. Why? Because uh, uh, loss of function was also observed in the saturation genome editing assay from Findlay. And in addition, there was um, uh, literature which showed that there was an mRNA uh, effect by using of a critic spy site, 65 nucleotides downstream. And therefore, that combination um, in the CANFA guidelines, you used PS3 very strong. For the ACMG BSC1 and 2 guidelines, and you can still apply PS3, but only for the part for the Findlay assay, because that is a functional assay. So you can still use PS3 at a strong uh, level of evidence. But in addition to that, you can use PVS1 RNA on the basis of the, uh, the, 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 splice, the splice effect you see using the mRNA assay. So um, this is in, in total a stronger uh, and more, more evidence but in the end, you will end up at pathogenic anyway. The, there was discussion on PS1. Um, also for a nine, um, for the, the Canfic UK guidelines, you could use a supporting level of evidence. And for, of course, for the ACMG BSC1 and 2 guidelines, you could use PS1, as I just explained to you. However, that is not possible because the pathogenic variant that was already known, which is plus 60 to G instead of T to C, has a stronger prediction in SPICE AI than the variant under assessment here, T2C. So PS1 cannot be applied as the SPICE AI prediction is yeah, lower than the known variant. Uh, but still, there is um, uh, you will get too strong and one supporting. So that is more than enough evidence. Next slide. That brings us to the PS3 functional data code. So PS3 is of course applicable also in the BSC1 and 2 guidelines and PS3 as well um, for a, a whole list of, uh, of functional assays that have been approved by Enigma. Um, splicing data though from RNA, from RNA studies just moved to PVS1 RNA as I just explained to you. So next slide, please. In table nine, from the guidelines, you will find all variants that have been tested in one of the Enigma uh, approved uh, functional assays. So you can just look up your variant in this table and you'll get the result. Obviously, that is a frozen moment for now. And I suppose there will be an update later on. But if there is an essay that is not in this list, that is possible, but then you have to uh, work out for yourself whether this essay is appropriate. And um, so if you, if, if you know that there is a functional data on a variant and it is not present in this table, you can uh, do it yourself. Next slide, please. Happily, uh, this data is already present. So Burnage has presented a way how you can calculate the weight of your uh, functional assay. And it is quite straightforward, but still a lot of work. And the, and the Canfic UK has done it for many functional tests already. Next slide, please. And they can be found here on the website of Canfic UK. And there's a whole list of functional tests that have been burnished for you. And then you know at what strength you can apply a certain functional test. Next slide. And this, this is the example from the Canfic UK, which you can see for each gene, which functional tests are available and what strength you can apply uh, the PS3 and BS3 for um, pre your variant under analysis. Next slide. Next slide. 
And if you want to have more details on how to burn it's your functional essay, uh, I would like to refer to webinar two in which it was in, explained in more detail. Now we move to the frequency part. Um, uh, the frequency uh, information can be divided in three categories, PM2, BA1, and BS1, as we already, of course, know. For PM2, next slide, please. Uh, we know more guidelines, and the ACGS guideline uh, and the CANVIC guidelines uh, already suggested use a moderate strength if a variant is not present in the NOMAD database. The ClinGen VSEP for BC1 and 2 uh, only applies PM2 at supporting level. However, they validated this data on the data set for males and females together, the non-cancer males and females. So that's different from Canvic UK that uses only um, the females. Next uh, slide. And there is evidence for that. So uh, a, a likelihood ratio was calculated for all likely benign variants in the data set and 175 likely benign variants um, uh, were absent in NOMAD versus 116 out of 140 pathogenic variants. Um, um, which gives you a likelihood ratio of almost three. Uh, so three times enriched pathogenic variants are almost three times enriched. And that is enough evidence for uh, supporting, uh, at least supporting uh, um, the PM2. And um, the problem is that if you look at variants that occur once in NOMAD, uh, this was not informative. 71 out of the 609 likely benign variants uh, occurred once in NOMAD versus 16 out of 140 pathogenic variants. And that is exactly the same. So there is no enrichment for pathogenic variants in the category variant that occurred once in NOMAD. So that was the reasoning not, uh, not to, to really keep the level at zero uh, occurrences in NOMAD. Next slide. Um, for BA1, it is identical, uh, the visa BSC1 and 2, is identical to the CANVIC guidelines, except for the fact that, again, CANVIC uses cancer-free females, while uh, Enigma uh, didn't look at that and included males and females together. Next slide, please. For the BS1, you can use uh, the WIFM calculator. Again, that this has been extensively uh, explained in webinar two. And using this WIFM calculator, we uh, also came up with the same level for uh, BS1 strong. But in addition to that, using uh, likelihood ratios, uh, the VSEP was able to also apply a BS1 strength sub for variants that are less rare than uh, BS1. Uh, so already at a frequency of 0.02%, uh, BS1 supporting can be applied, which is very useful for those variants that are rare but not rare enough. And so that is a bit more helpful. Next slide, please. I give an example for emissions variants from run 10 from the last run. Uh, in this case, BP1 supporting was applied by Kenvik. And that cannot be done via the ACMG BSC1 and 2 guidelines. And, and I will come back to that later because this variant is outside any of the known uh, 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 important domains. However, you can for that use BP1 strong that is completely at the bottom of this table. And, and this is a new code. And I will come back to that later again uh, to explain it in more detail. So BP4 supporting could not be used, but you can use instead of that the BP1 strong. For this variant, we saw that it occurred once in a homozygous male. And for that, we used the Fanconi code or non Fanconi code BS2 supporting. Um, as it was in a healthy individual, and which is one healthy individual in NOMAD, and therefore you could apply BS2 supporting. Um, according to the uh, ACMG VSEP guidelines, uh, this variant, which occurred at a frequency of, well, this number, 0.08%, uh, which is higher than the, 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 the level for BS1 supporting, so you can apply BS1 supporting. And this is, has a higher prevalence than BS2, so you have a slightly different code, but at the same strength for the specific variant. And in this case, you easily come up at a uh, benign 
uh, level of evidence. Next slide, please. That brings us to PS4, and that makes it more complex. PS4 is for a case, uh, case control analysis. So the prevalence of a variant in affected individuals is significantly increased compared with the prevalence in controls. Next slide, please. If you look at case counting, which is uh, still popular, especially in the UK, is not really allowed under the VSAP rules. Not for check two, not for ATM, and not for BSC one and two. I put it in between brackets because the rules do not say you are not allowed to use it, but it is uh, not recommended to use it. Next slide, please. And it is just, it is too complicated to really trust on case counting or proband counting as it is also being called um, for several reasons. Uh, also because PS4 case counting, you have to use a the zero. You need to know that PM2 is applicable. And in that moment, you would use PM2 and PS4 together, and that is would be double dipping, which is not allowed. So um, in the end, the, the VSEP uh, concluded that it is unwise to stipulate specific criteria for BSC1 and 2 uh, to use uh, probant counting, case counting um, for BSC1 and 2. Uh, keeping it in mind, this is also an American uh, and also used, in, uh, of course, in the US. In the UK, there is a specific use of the UK Biobank in which you have a proper control data set. So I'm not going to discuss that, but for this rules, it is, like I said, it was, uh, we didn't make any specific criteria to use PS4 uh, in general, but if you work out the details yourself, you can apply it. Next slide, please. For case control data, of course, you can apply it even at strong level, um, of evidence, and it is uh, uh, if your variant is consistent with a high increased risk of cancer. So an odds ratio of over four and with a significant result. However, next slide, um, case control is preferably used on the PP4 uh, in a complete multifactorial likelihood analysis together with other variables that you can use on the PP4. So, but you can use case control data sets, uh, case control data, also in the BSC 1 and 2 framework. Next slide. And here I would like to give a word to Claire for this slide. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to um, give some details of how we um, specify PS4 in the CAMVIC guidance. Um, so in regard of a case control analysis, um, we allow a bit more, or we prescribe a bit more flexibility in the strength of association. Um, so you can have stronger evidence for um, if the p-value is much stronger and likewise um, some lower evidence points if the uh, p-exact isn't meeting the 0 0.05 threshold. And that gives a bit more flexibility than that sort of single binary, you can either have strong or nothing. Um, uh, this, we, we took the ACMG cutoff of an odds ratio of five. I think Enigma used four because that's sort of what was evolved in that 2015 Eastern paper as being a high penitence breast cancer gene. Uh, we also um, specify around, um, if you, this is assuming you're using population data, so you're quantifying all uh, un unselected breast cancer cases. If you're using enriched breast cancer cases, we stipulate that you need to attain an odds ratio of 10 rather than five. And then as Arjun says, we um, do still allow some um, quite, I mean, we quite specific around the um, requirements for a low population frequency, but that you could have um, supporting PS4 if you have um, five or more HBOC families identified with a low um, control frequency and or if you have 10 or more reported in the literature and you have a, um, a absolute absence in um, UK biobank or appropriate controls, then you could have moderate. So we do allow that. And we have updated our guidance um, and that the new update will be released um, by the uh, by um, the next round of um, the EQA. So we do specify that you shouldn't be using the same data set for your PM2 and your PS4, because as Arjun said, this is then double counting. So that we would recommend using UK Biobank for PS4 and females again, so it should be ethnicity match and gender match, and then to use um, Nomad for PS2. 
Thank you. I will continue now with the PP5. And PP5 is the reputable uh, source. And this code is no longer in use. Uh, it is, uh, as it is not an appropriate level of evidence. Next slide, please. But uh, Kenvik UK used the, the, this code strength for, to, to include the, 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 um, uh, the, the, to include the multifactorial likelihood analysis from Enigma, and you had to put it somewhere and they put it in uh, PP5. However, um, the, the SVI, the, the, the big boss from all the VSEPs, did not allow us to use that also for the VSEP BSC 1 and 2 guidelines. And therefore, we have put that in PP4. So, exactly the same as for here for PP5. But uh, then uh, we call it PP4. That's the only difference. Next slide, please. Um, so you can use uh, likelihood scores. If it's strong enough, you can even use it at a very strong evidence level. And if it's low enough, you can use that support at a very strong against opportunity. Um, but exactly, this is exactly the same as in the U in, in the Canfield UK guidelines, but only using a different code. Next slide, please. This is getting more interesting. PP3, that is the in silico data, multiple lines of computational evidence support a deleterious effect on the gene or gene product. Um, you all know this code. Next slide, please. However, you can apply it in different ways. Uh, the original guidelines suggested to use multiple tools. Uh, the Canvic UK guideline in 2022 uh, su uh, suggested to use only REVEL. And for PP3, using REVEL over 0.7. For splicing, uh, there were still a couple of assays that you can, uh, uh, a couple of prediction programs that you can use. Um, perhaps you have heard the news. Now also Google has a uh, protein uh, prediction impact uh, score. I haven't looked into that yet, uh, but I suppose that that will also be part of the uh, uh, guidelines in the next version. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, if you look at the, the clinch and fee set for BSA 1 and 2, uh, oh, unfortunately, I think they chose yet another prediction model, base del, which was slightly uh, better for BSA 1 and 2, and also, uh, be also better to predict the effect of uh, indel variants, not only missense variants. And um, it was tested that the base del score over 0.28 for BSA 1 and over 0.30 for BSA 2. Unfortunately, not the same score. You can apply PP3. However, you can only do that if your variant of interest is within an important functional domain. If your variant is outside the functional domain, next slide. Uh, next slide. You can apply BP1 strong. I will come back to that later. So no revel here, but base del at about 0.3 as a cutoff value. Uh, next slide. Yeah, BP1 strong. I mentioned it a couple of times. The original code is a missing variant in a gene for which primarily truncating variants are known to cause disease. For BSE 1 and 2, this is um, uh, disputable. Uh, there are missing variants known to be pathogenic, but only inside the clinically important functional domains. Outside these domains, missing variants are rarely, if at all, uh, 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 pathogenic in any case. So if you have a silent substitution, a missense variant, or an in-frame insertion um, uh, outside a potentially clinically important functional domain, and you do not expect a splicing e effect, you can apply BP1 strong at a standalone. So BP1 strong alone is enough for a likely benign classification. Next slide, please. If your missense variant is inside a clinical important functional domain, then uh, 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 if you have a base del score below 0.18, uh, you can apply BP4. And if this variant is, uh, is, uh, is a silent variant inside the clinically important domain or outside the acceptor and donor motives, you can also apply BP7. And this is identical to Kenfig UK guideline. Next slide, please. So again, outside of these domains, you can just use BP1 strong, standalone, likely benign as evidence level. Next slide. 
And then we have got a couple of other codes and uh, like uh, PM1, speaking about important domains, PM4, if a protein length of the protein is, is changed, or PM5, if you have a novel missing change at an amino acid position that is known to be pathogenic, uh, those codes are all considered as component of the bioinformatic analysis and is, are not separately applicable. So all these codes um, uh, are not present in the DSC-01 and 2 guidelines. Next slide. So everything I just told you is summarized here in this flowchart. If you start, for example, um, um, uh, with a uh, missense variant that does not have any predicted impact on splicing and is not inside a functional domain, you end up at BP1 strong, likely benign. If it is in a functional domain and it uh, does predict to have an impact on splicing, you can apply PP3 um, and perhaps PS1. If it does not predict an impact on splicing, you can apply BP4. And in this, and this is also a figure from the uh, guidelines. Here are the exact values again, uh, what you expect for Basedel and for Spice AI to uh, to apply these codes. And the same for silent variants and intronic variants. I'm sorry. Um, so this is a figure, and that is in the in the guidelines. And you can use it, and you can print it out, and it's very easy to apply. Next slide, please. If you look now at the variant, missense variant from run 10, um, uh, the, the, the alanine 12 79 3 onine, um, there is functional data from the Bauman paper that this variant is neutral. So under ACMG BSC1 and 2 and CAMFIC, you can apply BS3 at a strong level. Um, however, for as this variant is outside the functional domain, um, you can use BP1 strong under BS under the, the FISAP guidelines and BP1 supporting under the uh, CANVIC UK guidelines. And the last one is a likelihood score, and that is identical in both guidelines, but the, the UK guidelines says BP5 and the, the FISAP guidelines says BC, BS4. And of course, you come up with a benign variant under these conditions. Next slide, please. However, this is a missense variant, which is not present in NOMAD. Um, so you can apply PM2 supporting on the uh, PSAP and PM2 moderate on the CAMFIC UK. It is outside a domain, outside an important domain. So you can apply BP1 strong uh, for, BSC, for the BSC1 and 2 FISAP guidelines. But BP4 under the CAMFIC UK guidelines is not applicable as the level is too high for that. So you cannot apply BP4. So in this for this specific example, if you use Canfic UK, you end up at a cold fuss. And if you apply the, the, the VSAP rules, you end up at a likely benign score already because of the PP1 strong standalone criterion. Next slide, please. And now I hand over um, to Claire. Next slide. Um, so uh, we tried to summarize the main differences um, against the um, Enigma VSIP guidance and the current CAMVIG UK BRCA12 um, specific interim guidance. Um, so if we've divided them up. So these are things which are, these are differences which have quite a significant impact on the score. And actually, um, there was concern around these would potentially result in downgrading if we moved um, whole, uh, full scale across to the Enigma guidance uh, from using the CAMVIG UK guidance. Next, um, so the first one is um, allowing use of PM5. So we still allow use of PM5 as sort of in the spirit of the original ACMG. So we specify moderate and supporting depending on the reference variants and the difference in score of the in silico tool, but either which way effectively you, you lose one or two kind of tabtidium points, either effectively supporting or moderate. Uh, next animation. Um, again, we allow PM1. Um, so again, applied at moderate or supporting if it's at a um, key amino acid residue, uh, moderate, or if it's um, within one of the key domains at supporting. So again, this has um, come out 
of the Enigma v -Sip. So again, this would be a potential to lose one or two points at moderate or supporting. Uh, next animation, um, BP5 and BP6, um, uh, as Arjun explained, uh, we previously allowed um, reputable guide, um, reputable classifiers. Um, it's now just a question of location and um, liaising with Miranda Durkee. There's no reason actually we can't move these codes to the same places as the Enigma. So that removes a discrepancy. Um, and we also allow PM4 and BP3 again in this in the um, spirit of the um, the sort of broader historic ACMG. So again, that's a discrepancy. Next slide. Um, and again, it's it's un, unlike it's very low frequency, but PS2 and PM6 we still have included as per the original ACMG. Should there be de novo um, observations, but um, we will recognise that's highly unusual. Um, next slide. Um, so again, uh, these are again places where it's going to be a high impact um, with a potential um, loss of points, and the big one here is PM2. So as Arjun highlighted, um, Enigma only allows supporting, we still allow um, moderate or supporting. Um, so again, that's potentially um, quite a significant distinction. Um, we, um, again, um, had specified using female controls only because again, it's around sort of observation. We're talking about sort of female specific cancers. Next slide. Um, and then again, these are criteria which are scored differently. So again, potential for impact and downgrade. And again, as I've highlighted, PS4 is the main one here. So carry on, next and next animation. Uh, yep, so again, we allow a, a broader range of scoring. Um, next slide. And again, case counting, next slide. Um, and then uh, PP3, again, potentially, we are a little bit more permissive, next animation. Um, because we don't specify domains, uh, but as Arjun indicated, Revel and Bayesdell, they both come out as very high performing in all of the um, cross tool analyses. So sometimes Revel will be higher, sometimes Bayesdell will be higher, and sometimes one will be over the threshold or the other. Um, so that may not be a major impact on points for variants occurring within the critical domains. Next slide. Okay, I'll hand back over to Arjun. Yeah, no. I'm sorry, my video is working. Yeah, it works again. Just a summary what we have covered uh, in the last hour an overview of the Enigma guidelines compared to the Canfit UK guidelines, and a review of the resulting differences in the coding and the classification of, of different variants. Uh, as you can see, I, I think the, the differences are minor but still present and still room for con uh, confusing uh, coding, especially in the classification of variants. Um, next slide, please. And I hand over now to Sandy, I suppose, or Simon. Thank you, Aaron. It's me. Thank you for that. Thank you both very much indeed for such a, an educational, um, great explanation of the how the guidelines have come about and also how to apply them, but also the differences between the two. So I think my ask, question to you both is, which one should individuals use right now when there is a difference between classification for a particular variant? Claire, I'm gonna to come to you first. I would... Um use whatever guidance you're using for classifying variants in your lab. Um, so as I emphasize, we would seek to, in the UK, move towards consensus ACMG, and then that's also moving towards um, the disease-specific VSIP guidance. But we are just in a period of pause, and that is why we are out of sync. But I very much hope both the broader ACGS guidance and then CAMVIG um, over the next sort of year, 18 months, will be able to get more in line with the, the new ACMG and therefore the, um, the, the specific BSIC guidance. But I think for the moment it is, it, I, I think the logic would be to use whatever 
guidance or combination you're using day to day for classifying variants. And then I think the marking of the ACMG does encompass using all of these different um, uh, classification systems. And just to emphasize, um, uh, working with Miranda and various other of the senior clinical scientists behind the scenes of CAMVIG, we have done some updates. They're quite minor, but we will release the updated version of the CAMVIG specific guidance. It's got a little bit more around thresholds and when to use UK Biobank and that type of thing. So there's nothing that dramatic, but we will release that ahead of um, the EQA round. Fantastic. That's great. And if you can give us messaging, we can help get that um, notification out. So continue as you're doing, but be aware of the new guidance coming out as and when it, it's available. Thank you for that. So could we just pop back aside, please, Amy, just to say that um, run 11 of the BRC1, BRC2 and the other HRR gene variants EQA will be going live in October. So for the calendar month of October, um, registration is now open and you can use this link here um, or contact either EMQN central office or the GenQA office and we can send you out the link and give you any help and advice if you haven't logged on before and we'll be using the new Genie system going forward so hopefully that will um, make the experience easier for participants as well so thank you um, and please get in touch if you need any further information around the EQAs so if we just move on then Amy I see Simon we've got a Q&A now and we've got lots of questions coming in do you want to kick us off uh yeah i've just been triaging them as they come through see, so yes, yeah um, so thank you to all of you for um adding your questions in there so please do keep them coming we would ask though that if you're if you've got a specific question about a particular um classification uh coding for example that you do preface your question with what classification coding you're looking at there's been a couple that come through it's sometimes difficult to interpret um, what you're what what question you're asking? So please do give us a bit of clarity there to to allow us to talk to Claire and to Arjun about exactly what you're ask you're asking. Um, I've got a sort of general point for both of you, just as a sort of kicking us off and starting us off. Um, have you come across any examples where the classification of a variant using the new Enigma guidelines uh, is categorically, and I mean completely different, uh, or reaches a different classification? Um, than the than the existing guidance. So, for example, where you might get a VUS versus a pathogenic, and how do you think we should address um, cases like that, which may have an impact on patient management? Well, that is a very uh, very good question, and I know for the people also participated in the EMQN panel HBOC uh, um, um, uh, uh, test that was recently published now, um, the first variant in there was classified as likely pathogenic according to the CANFIC rules, but I looked at it and it had an occurrence of one male in NOMAD. So on the basis of that, P is one, uh, and PM2 could not be applied as there was one male present in NOMAD. The UK doesn't count males, so that's still zero. But the the FISA guidelines do count males, and that is one. So strictly speaking, following those rules, you came up at the VUS. Um, and that gave also, I think, one of the reasons that was quite a discussion on that variant, whether it was a VUS or, or, or likely pathogenic variant. Um, I hope we don't do not have too many of those variants, uh, as that will be very confusing. Um, and I do not recommend downgrading your variant on the basis of a novel guideline uh, as the difference in it is all a matter of, of likelihoods in this mm -hmm. case the likelihood of this variant being pathogenic just slightly dropped below a agreed level but a completely um, uh, just agreed level there is there's there no true science whether the level of evidence needs to be 95 percent or 94 percent so I, I would recommend not to go too quickly in changing classifications because of another rule which is obviously, a, I think that's a very, a very valid point, Arden. It's, 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 a, it's a worry or concern here, I suppose, from the from the user groups about these, I mean, I would call them edge cases because hopefully, as you say, they don't occur very often. Um, but there is a there is a likelihood of potentially that coming coming in. Claire, did you have anything you want to say to that at all? Well, no, it, it's, it's, it was just to highlight, we did have a working, well, we had a 
workshop in uh, by Canvig, and we also have this national MDT, which Canvig is predominantly clinical scientists and some clinical geneticists, and our national MDT is predominantly the clinical geneticists and some clinical scientists. So we had um, working a a, um, a workshop in the national MDT, and then another one in Canvig around reclassification, and talked about, and we did so we published a paper which does at least sort of put out some guidance around so it it's variants where you shift across the actionable threshold mm. um, and as Arjun said it's only one point and the actionable threshold is completely arbitrary yeah. and we say that it's 90% likelihood of pathogenicity as if we're that precise and then if you have five um, exponent points um, evidence points as per the Tavertigian system you're a VUS if you have six you're likely pathogenic so there's this dichotomy in the clinical action for, it, for what can be a, a very small, it can just be, you know, a rebel score that's just one side of the threshold while the Bayes-Dell is the other. So again, we give some recommendations when things are making small moves across this actionability threshold that you don't go full scale in contacting all your old families or whatever. Um, but it is certainly something that as we have emerging new evidence, as we have guidance that's evolving as we have different sources of guidance there does need to, there will you know need to be local policies around how you deal with mm. what will be minor shifts that just happen to flip it one side or other of that actionability threshold fantastic thank you both um sandy do you have any questions you want to bring up yeah i think we've got we've got one here that i'm going to come on about um reclassification but there's quite a few questions going in the chat on the same theme as to are these guidelines appropriate to use for somatic variants now my view would be no they are very much germline focused guidelines um, and we have the um amp pasco guidelines for somatic and because we have that level of whether or not the um clinically relevant within that cancer type but Claire and Arjun I'd be interested to hear your thoughts Claire you want to come in first well yes that's good because this is actually it's um because essentially for BLC1 and 2 you're classifying a tumor observed variant or yes for those two with, genes with yeah. the view of using it as a germline variant so that's a bit yeah. different to yeah. you know I don't know classifying an EGFR variant you're finding in the tumour. Yeah. So I think that perspective is different. So I think probably, it, and then there's this awkward, I think there's this awkwardness because you've got your somatic classification, which is all about actionability. So the whole framing is very different versus your germline systems, which are about pathogenicity. But I think in these instances, you are classifying it in regard of taking it forward and using it in the germline. So there's no point in having one classification for the somatic system, mm. which then when mm. you confirm it is indeed germline in origin, that it then has a sort of, it has a different um, pathogenicity classification. So yeah. I, I would say for BRC1 and 2, you classify tumor observed variants in manner of how you would classify them if they're found in the germline. If they are likely pathogen or pathogenic, it's then relevant to go on and do that germline confirmation. And um, we, we published some data in Annals of Oncology showing really for most tumor types, it actually doesn't vary as much as you'd have thought. It's around about 80% that if they're, if they're a reasonable, if they're an appreciable allele frequency in the tumor, they're likely to be germline in origin. Yeah, I agree with that. But I think you have mm. to put it in the clinical context. So it's not for to that you could, because we see in a lot of our somatic EQAs that um, germline guidelines are used to apply for variant pathogenicity, which is fine to determine the pathogenicity at the level variant, but not in that clinical setting necessarily, because you've got to bring in the actionability side as well. So it's very complex. And, and yeah. Just, in there the somatic variant classification is even more challenging and disparate across participants as well so um yes i think we haven't even addressed that yet if you take into account that um for pop inhibitors for example you, you need a, a pathogenic lactic pathogenic variant yes and it doesn't matter then if it's somatic or germline origin 
And in that case, you should use this, an, an, a comparable approach to come to your classification. Mm -hmm. And indeed, it is very confusing if the, uh, the pathology report mentions a, a, a clinical relevant variant, and then the genetic lab comes back, oh, it's a VUS. That mm. is extremely confusing. Yeah. And I think for these genes, um, especially BSC1 and 2, uh, I would strongly recommend to keep the germline guidelines. So this is a germline guideline um, at hand because it is, as Kerr says, um, possibly a, a sometimes likely germline variant. Absolutely. And also there's a sort of workflow. So again, we in, in the... Um... Uh, so it was an ESMO working group, what was written up in Annals of Oncology, that you can have a sort of pragmatic filtering for your workflow. So you then get variants that are found in the tumour that are putatively of germline origin. Before you go to the patient and talk to them and get the germline sample, at that point, you want to do a formal classification to ensure that your sort of automated pipeline that it would still for formally be likely pathogenic or pathogenic because there'll be nothing more confusing or nonsensical to talk to a cancer patient undergoing active management, scare the bejesus out of them, you know, do all the whole germline talk and then go, actually, it's bust, so we won't manage you anyway. You know, that would just be okay. ludicrous. So it's, I think it's really important that there's a pause. You've done, you've done the tumour analysis. It's got a reasonable um, VAF. It, it, it on automated pipeline appears to be pathogenic, um, you know, either it's truncating or it's, you know, it's in Klimva or whatever. You pause, you do your formal classification, you only talk to the patient and the clinical team if it's something that would be taken forward. Would you agree, Arjun? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Really helpful advice. So that brings yeah. me on. So I'm into my last question, what I wanted to just bring up about ClinVar. So what do we do with variants that are reported in ClinVar right now as either reviewed by the expert panel and are benign or are pathogenic? So should we be routinely now rechecking them on the understanding of new guidance coming out? Like I just want to come in, go on, kick us off. <laughs> I, like I just mentioned, I wouldn't now... Uh, reclassify all your previous variants if you classify them under a different system. And I don't think that's very useful uh, to do. But if it comes up now in a new patient, obviously you will normally uh, reclassify your variant under the under the guidance that you have now, um, but not retrospectively going back to families to, um, uh, to make a lot of noise about a reclassification if it is not based on new new data, of course. If there is new data, a functional assay that is clearly stating it's not pathogenic, you've of course a different story. But in generally speaking, I would recommend now going back to recalculate all your existing variants. Great, thank you. Claire, do you agree? Yeah, so that was in our um we got into like this really overly convoluted schematic in our guidance paper about reclassification. So there were sort of three factors. There were what was driving the new points. So is it new data or is it just a change in guidance? What's the magnitude of the change and where did it shift it to? And these sort of three factors would would determine, like Arjun said, do you go back to all your old families and get them in? Do you um, just pause and deal with the patient in front of you. And we did prescribe a time window over which you should wait um, and just see what new evidence comes out and, and, and let, the, let the ground settle. So I, I completely agree that just going back to all your old family's knee jerk for, for what is a kind of <clears throat> shift in points, particularly arising from new guidance is not helpful for anyone. Um, I, I did, um, I remember challenging um, or asking specifically Stephen Harrison, who is one of the big SVI um, yeah. people around and it is it is the SVI mantra that that whenever you encounter a new variant you should review the evidence and reclassify now if it if it's already been classified by Enigma and it's got you know a huge burden of evidence it's it's a perfunctory kind of couple of minutes you know just eyeballing but the notion would be there could be new data that's emerged at any point um, for any variant, so you should always look again. So, so that is because actually the VSIPs don't like that. They, they, they sort of feel that they should, or some of them, they should be providing the authority of classifications for their genes, and um, lab users should just take them verbatim. But the the central SVI 
ClinGen position is that ev every person who's signing off a variant classification should have reviewed the evidence each time. Now, labs may have a procedure that if it's been classified locally within three months or six months, it's a reasonable position not to look at it again. And the balance of probability, that's, a, that's an absolutely kind of appropriate, pragmatic approach. Great, thank you. I think there's a big breath of relief, <laughs> sigh of relief <laughs> just across the globe after that statement. Thank you. <laughs> Simon, back to you, please. Thank you, Sandy. Um, so we've got quite a lot of questions coming in very, very specific to particular variant classification criteria, of, of which I suspect most of will pick up actually outside of this webinar because they're so detailed, it would be better to have a, a written response rather than perhaps a, verb, a verbalised response on the on the hoof. But there's quite a few, a couple of which I've picked up about, for example, case control data, which is interesting. So I will go through, I will put one of them to you, which is about BS1 and PM2 uh, calculations. And then maybe have I've got a general question, more general question about control data in, in specifically. So um, it's probably Arj, and I suspect this is more addressed to you. But what's Enigma's rationale to the use of frequency of uh, to use frequency of female and male non-cancer controls for BS1 PM2 calculations? Um, I think the easiest answer is that um, that was not really thought through that used the the FISIC used the available data set the easiest to apply data set and the FAF is is easily applied for the for the complete group males and females together um, um, and for that they calculated the appropriate uh, weights so it is a the the assumption that were made had been calculated that was a, a likelihood score in one direction or another, so appropriate on that data set. So you can only apply the data set that was applied um, uh, when validating that specific code. So that's why you have to use for the for the for the V set mm -hmm. classification. You have to use the complete data set as the code was uh, validated on that. Um, and now you can say, well, it's perhaps better to use the female data set as those are where the cancers occur for BSC one and two mostly. Um, Perhaps that's true, uh, but it wasn't validated on that specific data set. So yeah, there is either legacy issue as much as anything else. That's yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, Claire, did you have anything you wanted to say to that at all? Um, I think it's also it's because um, we took Nomad out and separated it out, but I think it's only relatively recently that it's been publicly available to to flip between male and female and so mm -hmm. forth. So I think as Arjun said, it's a sort of um, practicality in terms of data availability. I always just, um, the, the phrase cancer-free controls, this is Nomad with TCGA taken out, which TCGA was really enriched for like, you know, there were like, I don't know, like tons of paragangliomas in there and so forth. So it was this really odd data set to contaminate the rest of Nomad with. The remainder of Nomad is not cancer-free. It's essentially a sort of funny amalgam, but for the sake of argument, it should if you take out TCJ, have as much cancer in as the general population. Okay, so uh, that leads me on to my next question then, because I think what you've you've you, you're defining there from both of you is that there is a difference in terms of the way control data is incorporated or applied to um, um, the classification guideline guidelines. So do you know whether there's a plan to review or modify current guidelines to incorporate um, more appropriate case control data sets and therefore enable more accurate classification as a consequence? I mean, there... I mean, I would say it's a very small difference. So it's intellectually slightly more um, satisfactory to use female controls. In practice, it makes a very small difference. But like everything else, there are the edge case variants mm. that, as Arjun described, they'll be the ones where it makes the difference yeah, just yeah. from one single individual. Um, so again, I, I think in terms of Canvig UK, we, we were specifying what we felt to be the best use of the data. But again, we need to converge on a single approach. And I think either females only is 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 a, a little bit better but it's it's not a it's not a major difference right okay and okay. and the problem will solve itself <clears throat> as in the new version of the acmg rules uh pm2 is altogether skipped so the the the, the absence of variance in nomad is no longer any evidence 
Yeah. But all towards pathology. Of course, it is towards benignity, but not towards yeah. pathogenicity. Yeah. And um, uh, also, nomad is growing. So one at the, at a certain moment in time, a variant will pop up in in nomad. So. Yeah. And also, um, UK Biobank is going to be absorbed into Nomad, which I think will help. So essentially, my understanding of the new ACMG, because you have a case control signal, which can either be towards pathogenicity, if there is a high frequency in cases or controls, or towards benignity, if there's a high frequency in controls than cases. So effectively, PS4 and PM2 and in fact BA1 and BS1 can all be um, incorporated in a sort of that single observation um, and potentially if you put all your data sets in one place that gives you the most power. Yeah I was kind of I wasn't mentioning the specifics but I was aware of the fact that that data is going mm. to be incorporated into Nomad and so it will you know it'll, it'll it might make it make a significant it might have a significant difference potentially. Yeah, I mean, I think all this speaks to the fact that um, that I can't see a point in the next five years where it's all nailed down, done and dusted. And we can say, oh, there'll be no more changes now. Um, so I think what we do need is local or national systems by which we can recognize the fact that this will be evolving. There will be new data. Yeah. The rules will change. The available data will change. And there'll be some variants which these changes just flip them across that actionability threshold. And we need sensible ways of dealing with essentially new data flipping across an absolutely arbitrary threshold. Yeah, I would agree. And we also need yeah. to consent our patients appropriately. Because again, we I think historically the clinical geneticists sort of <laughs> treated lightly pathogenic and pathogenic the same and you know gave very factual um uh, man you know sort of communication to the patient and i think although it's a bit awkward that the patients do need to be made aware particularly for lightly pathogenic variants that there is you know a, a, a small but you know um, a likelihood that it could be down classified and they may be or you know or, you know just more broadly they may be recontacted if new evidence is available yeah. I think we've generated some lively discussion there, which is fantastic. Um, okay, Sandy, over to you. Yeah, I'm just going through the guidance here. A couple of people have been asking Claire for a copy, uh, reference for the paper that you are mentioning. So we'll get be able to get that out to people as well. Also, yeah, and we can send out the PDF. That should be that fine. Would be super. Yeah, yeah very. It might happy. be illegal, but I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> well, if it's publicly available. We're, we're all friends here. Yeah, I think it we might are, be behind yeah. a paywall or something. We've got but, 336 um, friends on the call, so yeah. uh, <laughs> we're, we're friendly people. <laughs> Yeah. Um, one question, because, you know, we were all using Revel and we said this was the way forward, but now we've gone to Bayes-Dell. So um, is there an easy way to get the Bayes-Dell score? What's the yep. way of Ajahn's nodding furiously? Fantastic. Please yes. help. <laughs> I, this is the good point to really promoting BRCA Exchange. BRCAExchange.org uh, contains all the information. It has uh, specifically put the, 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 the base Dell in, and it also indicates whether or not the variant is in an appropriate domain. And if it is not, it is grayed out. So it is still it gives the base Dell, but it is grayed out, indicating do not even use, just apply BP1 strong, as long as your SPICE AI prediction, which is just below that score, is, uh, is also uh, below 0.1. So yes, that all the information is available and, uh, I cannot stress enough to use Braca Exchange as your starting point in variant classification for BSC or one and two. I think I'd also just put a shout out as well. Um, so Braca Exchange has some absolutely fantastic presentations of the data and really, really useful to explore that. Um, Canva UK, um, if you join the diet, you will all be diagnostic users so you can register and it's really quick. Um, but what that means is you get access to the forum. And then if you if you click on a variant, you can send out an inquiry. And it says a nice little email with the variant name in the header. And that goes to the full Canva UK user group, which spans six continents, I believe now. Um, but it's got pretty much all of the um, cancer genetics clinical scientists in the UK use it. Lots of guys in the Netherlands and um, Belgium use it in particular, but we've got people at Memorial, Vanderbilt in the States as well. And you just, you can ping out and everyone gets the email 
um, you will get a few emails. It's not loads. It's maybe half a dozen a week. Um, but there's some nice exchanges and it's you can, you know, you can particularly for genes like Lynch genes, you can ask if people have, you know, cases or tumor data. And, and there's a ton of data out there that's unpublished. Um, but a lot of people would use it for BRCA variants to to bounce off, you know, their proposed classifications and particularly ones that are a little um, unusual or whatever. And it's just a nice sounding board to get other opinions and even reassuring if you say, oh, you know, we're planning to classify this as likely pathogenic. If you don't get anyone shouting about saying that's lunacy, it is, um, it is in itself a sort of a, a way of sounding out a very broad set of people who are in the same field as you. So it's Canva UK and then go to register. Um, we don't let people who aren't involved in um, diagnostics register. So, so it's not got lots of kind of people doing you know, mouse models or, you know, kind of hassling you with irrelevant questions. It will, it will, it will all be around variant specific questions from like-minded people. And Claire, that sounds a really rich resource that's, you know, everyone needs. Would you be happy for the EQA schemes to sign point people in that direction on our next, you know, EQA summary report that goes out? Uh, yeah, that would be great. And we can also circulate from the meeting, the um, link, although you can Google Perfect. it. And sorry, I, I can't remember if I said it, but so it's also got lots of um, resources on it. So it's got, I think, 12 in silico tools. So it's got all the Splice AI scores, the Bayes-Dell scores, the Revel scores, um, the um, gene-specific aligned GBGD scores. It's got um, the whole of Nomad. You can flip um, between females and males and, and TCJ and non-TCJ. It's got UK Biobank extracted, which is very useful because that's quite difficult to access. Um, uh, unless you have um, signed up access to it. It's got data from our national NHS testing, which is a numerator and denominator of the frequency of variants as they've been um, encountered across all the English diagnostic labs. Uh, it's got all the functional assays relevant to BRCA in there. So it's it's a sort of, you know, designed to be a one-stop shop, shop yeah. Yeah, for absolutely. cancer susceptibility genes only. Um, but... Um, hopefully useful we, for those we have a we have a, a an audience participant who's just uh dropped us a message in the q a say highly recommended and that's from argentina so clearly it has a global <laughs> reach which is fantastic to see i may have to come and do a site visit to check they're <laughs> using it correctly okay. I mean, some, some <laughs> items that like like the i think the frequency of variants within the uk labs is not accessible for non-uk users but most of the information you can, is... you can access it. You can't see which labs they've been <coughs> seen in, so you can get a summary numerator and denominator for all observations, and a numerator denominator for um, those uh, for white British observations. So that's um, then comparable to the non-Finnish Europeans or the white British and UK buyback. Um, UK users can see if it's been seen in Sheffield or Exeter, but that's probably as a starting point not particularly of interest to non-UK users, but that was the kind of deal we had to cut around individual patient identifiability. But you can see it's been seen 14 times in, I think it's the new data are just about to go in. So I think we've got um, sort of about 80,000 proband. So they are probands who earn themselves a BRCA1 and BRCA2 test in the NHS. So they are reasonably enriched, um, so, but you have a numerator denominator for the frequency of observations. Sounds like a fantastic resource, which um, obviously, by definition, is is free to use for clinical diagnostic laboratories, and I'm sure it will make a difference. Um, it, I mean, I mean, anyone can access most of it, mm -hmm. but to, to be part of the chat community, yeah, we, we restrict that to clinical diagnostic okay, users just to stop people getting too many extraneous questions. Fantastic. Um, Sandy, I think we are coming up to the end of our time, actually. I think we should probably call it a day. Um, I think as we, as normal, we we would normally pick up any of the, the specific questions in in our um, summary scheme report at the end, which comes out at the end of the um, either at the end of the EQA run. Um, so we will do that for those very specific questions that you've you've asked us in the chat that um, we haven't addressed in today's meeting. Um, have we anything else you want we want to cover at all before we we move on to the thank yous? Just to say that the registration is open for um, the next EQA run and it will be open and live for participation during the month of October. Um, and then I believe we've got follow up webinar to discuss the results November. findings as well. Yeah. So I'm sure we will speak to you before the end of the year. 
Fantastic. And, and then to reassure uh, the use of the, the Kinjin guidelines or the use of the Kenfra guidelines, both are accepted in the in running uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Arjun, for that kind of clarification. Right. Um, let's call it a day. So thank you to all of you who have dialed, dialed in today. We had nearly 400 of you dial in, which is absolutely fantastic. Shows we're really we're getting to the places we need to. Um, so please do encourage your colleagues to dial in next time. Um, so a big, big thank you to today's speakers, Arjun and Claire, for their fantastic talk. Um, I hope you have found it uh, both educational and informative, uh, and we ho sincerely hope that it you know, helps you um, rationalise some of the differences between the guidelines that we've do, we've, we've we've highlighted today. Um, thank you also to uh, the team at uh, AstraZeneca and MSD for organising and supporting this webinar. And lastly, but thank you also to my co-host Sandy. Uh, fantastic job, uh, and we'll look forward to speaking to you all uh, in November at the next webinar, which is the last one, which summarizes Run 11. So please do, if you want to participate, get in contact with the GenQ or EMKN offices. We'll sort you out for a registration for the, for the EQA and we'll look forward to seeing you all in November. So thank you all once again and have a great, great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all. you.